everyone. Another day, another walkthrough, another product, more about liquid staking, right? So we are going to walk through um, a new protocol that coming on top of Steakhouse. Um, that is called ZEC. ZEC stands for Zero ETH Club. There's a lot to unpack, but I want to give a little bit high level overview if you are here for the first time. Um, so Steakhouse is a is an operating system for in um you know programmable staking on Ethereum. So Ethereum doesn't have a delegation mechanism. So we Steakhouse built in protocol delegation with an option for minting um liquid representation through the restaking. So you have you can register with the steakhouse as a validator and then later if you want to make a liquid representation you could basically restake by taking the proof. It's basically a click of a button, but you make a proof and then in execution layer, you create a stake tokenized position, right? So it creates this kind of whole balance in your consensus layer of that BLS key and it register. And then if you want to mint a liquid token representation for the, the stake that you have on a consensus layer, you can mint it. This is called DE and slow tokens. So it's a kind of a two tired staking in a sense where the users can have two different rev, you know, earning stream. One is a consensus rewards, another one is an MEV rewards. Um, when we talk about stakeouts and restaking, there is no mandatory requirement that you need to mint this derivative, but it's an optionality that stakeouts protocol give as an inventory mechanism. So Stakehouse is an operating state, you know, operating um, system for state uh, programmable staking, but it also gives this kind of a mark to inventory that they always keep uh, whatever the liquid positions on execution layer is synced with the consensus layer without any Oracle, without any intermediary, anyone can use it. It's full smart contracts when we say that. So, I'm going to share some web pages to give you some visual hook what we're talking here. So let me share that. And um, where are we? Okay, cool. So if you go to join Steakhouse website, you guys can see my screen, right? Yeah. So this is Steakhouse. And if you go to the monitoring and then you'll be here, this is the main net and you have Gorily as well. So in, in, in the main net, you can actually see liquid staking LSD indexes. These are different, different liquid staking networks. So if you go to DeFi Llama, you go to Stakeouts, you will actually see that these are different networks, Dream, LLS, Axel, Airplan. So all are different networks, but they're all having kind of fungible liquidity, but their the yield is separate, but they have this kind of a liquid position. So this is, one of the greater achievement that you can have the liquidity provision fungible in aggregate, but you have this kind of a decentralized node runners and decentralized capital allocation, isolated portfolio management, everything is built in and give it to you. But this is basically stakeouts provides you capability for to build all kinds of these applications. So LSD is, is a three pool so you have home staking here. If you're home staking, you can use it. But if you go to LSD, what it will do is you can just, you, you may know Lido, Rocket Pool, and all this kind of pooling. You can build your own liquid staking pooling. So this is like a three pools comes in. LSD network is a mainstream application that we built. Currently, it has a three pools, right? You can set up your own LSD networks within two minutes. But the three pools, which currently having uh, a mechanism, that will represent who you are and what you want to do in staking. So not everyone want to run a node, not everyone want to, to go for an MEV, but majority of people who want to have a risk-free rate, which means non-slashable. That's what the protected staking will enable you, right? So anyone who deposit into this pool, they will never see their ETH goes down. Their ETH will only goes up. And that 
yield is basically depends on which liquid staking that you are in our base set. And you can, uh, you can see all this information on how much the liquid staking is going and each and every ETH is correlated to which protocol, sorry, which validator you can actually see that validator address, how much ETH has been earned, what is the rate, how is your node runner running? These are all public information. There's no Oracle. These are coming from the node. So, and if you're a user, you may actually see your information. If even if you put 0.01 ETH, it will show you the validator details. So if you are a, a simple user and if you want to have some sort of, um, 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 if you want to deposit, you can deposit any amount starting from 0 0.01, right? ETH. So if you go here, you may actually see I have some protected staking here. And if you go to protected staking as a normal user, I can see all my ETH. I have like 79 ETH there. And I can see all the validators associated with this, my ETH went into and how many ETH is there and how much I've been earning. All this information are available. Similarly, if I'm using an MEV pool, MEV staking, in this case, I will only get the MEV earned by that validator and through the syndicate. So this is how it works. So LSD networks has been widely used and many people are building other kind of protocols like Bribe. There's a Bribe market right now, uh, which, which, which will allow you to, you know, get ETH to your LSD networks through front staking. Like you have, um, uh, if, if you have, um, um, friend, you can actually put your BLS key and then they can simply deposit directly to your validator here and they will stake. So all kind of optionality is there. Now, what, what are we seeing here in the ZEC? Um, is, um, but what's a, what's an enshrined, like, uh, what is an enshrined LSD? So enshrined LSD is kind of, um, Put it simple, you never have a token without having a stake backing it. So it's just the, the it's 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 in the it's in the network itself. It's um as long as you have an Ethereum, you can redeem that token for ETH. So it's not depends on any kind of market volatility or the liquidity requirement. You have 10 million or 20 million, no problem. You have one million or one ETH, you can always redeem it. So it's uh, it's the ETH is redeemable. So if I deposit my ETH, I'm not going to get a token straight away. No, no. So th that's the two different approach. Either you could have a deposit token, right, or you could have a derivative of staked. If you want to have a derivative, it, it need to be restaked. Because the staking happens on execution layer first beginning you register, and then it needs to be staked with a consensus layer, which is a different chain. And then you need to bring the, that chain state back to Ethereum to mint an ERC20 token. So no tokens will ever get minted from out of thin air. It will only get minted from an active balance. And it keep tracking that state on the chain, you know, um, consensus layer, the token balance on execution layer. So you can always be smart contract level guarantee. There's E that you can redeem it for um, any E any any representation D E that's been minted. And quote unquote, you, this is a accounting token D. If you are a existing liquid staking deposit token service, like for example ST, you will receive ST the moment that you send a token, right? They will give you ST, and then they will stake it. Rocket Pool will give you the same way that you know our ETH will give you. You can use the backend as a stakehouse and things like that, and you can just get rid of all the Oracle and need for operational requirement. It will massively reduce the operational cost and it's make it completely mutable and fully smart contract for them, right? And you don't really need any permission. You can still even down to the withdrawal. Yeah, even the withdrawals are completely automated on smart contracts. So which makes like you could have deposit token given to to R E or S T E, but your backend is completely powered by the smart contracts, so you don't really have this kind of midnight, you know, uh, you know the Oracle update rebasing things like that. Rather, 
your tokens are backed with atomically with ETH on the other layer. Um, and you can still keep the ETH or you can still keep the RETH. Uh, the accounting, the, the stake position will be there. If you want to withdraw, as a, if you want to, to mint the ETH, then you just basically like, you know, draw, withdrawing as a cash, right? Otherwise, you just, just keep it in account. So you don't really need to give the ETH. You can actually give your RE or SE, then you can just use it as an accounting. But LSD pools use this Stakehouse protocol to give the DE and then take advantage of launching a liquid staking network under a minute with less than $100, right? All you need to do is just a safe account, a also safe account connected, deploy an LSD network, and you're good to go allow anyone to register their BLS validator key as a node runner, and others can supply their ETH trustlessly for those account, you know, uh, BLS keys through front delegation, or they can simply put into a pool called Giant Pool, which is like an open pool, and the pool will give automatically the ETH, 32 ETH in three different compartments. So there are, think it like a three conveyor belts. One will only process the batches for 24 ETH. Another conveyor is just process, you know, four ETH. Another conveyor is just validate registration currently. But the, the first two channels will take any, any deposits starting from 0.01 ETH. Make sense? Like anyone can deposit 0.01 ETH and then they have a um, representation. Similarly, the MEV staking pool also allow you to stake 0.01 ETH. However, the node runner, the principal agent problem who is actually going to run a node should have currently in LSC network should have a 4E deposit where they will able to, you know, join, you know, it's an ad hoc system. So there is no KYC. There is no permissions. There is nobody. You don't really need to show any, anything to anyone. Just go and register, connect you to your wallet, like register BLS key. And registration means you just say that this is BLS key. It's an arbitrary length, not arbitrary. So what's what's the four ETH for? What's the the four ETH for? Uh, the four ETH is for um, they. It's just basically they're part of the deposit in a validator thirty two. Technically speaking, but you can you can consider this as an if it is a very open pool, anyone can join. You may want to have some sort of a protection. Let's say I am a node runner. Nobody knows me. I have a wallet, ledger wallet. I connected, and I, you know, I added my BLS key, and I'm going to run this machine uh, with 32 e. When I'm running this machine, I can just switch it off, or I can do some sort of. I will be. I don't need to be malicious, but I did did something wrong. Where the staking has a problem is reducing the balance, called slashing or leakage. So when the validator has started the business as a staking validation in consensus layer, it it need 32 ETH, but the 32 ETH can come down up to 16 ETH in a normal case. But if there is an attack, it can go up to zero, but this is a very, very unlikely event. But 16 ETH is like you can maximum leak. So if I am an unknown person, I could just simply sit idle and then you know leak the money. So the four E you could take from a social perspective, a, a protection for a larger deposit, 24 plus four E, 28 E get protection. They will not get diluted rather than an unknown person by you. You're saying that I have four E stake in this validator. I'm going to run the machine, but if there is any leakage, it will go from my piece, not from you. So that gives some sort of a confidence that, that gives some sort of protection. Even if there is some slashing, it will it will be more than enough to cover any kind of loss. And remember, if you're in LSD network, an LSD manager can always initiate an ejection, which means it can it can use a mechanism called a DKG based MPC system to recover an encrypted key stored on the Ethereum blockchain if there is certain you know leakage happens only to to post an um, exit message on its consensus layer and allow that stake to come back to execution layer and do redistribute it to the original depositors. No one can touch the money. It will only go to the LP positions, but that 
ETH that is staked and it's sitting on a consensus layer need to come back, right? For in order to do that, you need to have this kind of an signing key that's the operational key that is only in the position of the node runner. Someone has to decrypt it, but it can only decrypt with a smart contract if the original node runner has gone completely rogue or it's been missing any unfortunate event. The this at stake dormant you know deposit has to come back and given back to the original depositors. That's basically like you know solving the principal agent problem. So does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So what is a ZEC, right? What is what we're going to do here is like we are currently seeing a a lot of developments around LSTs and liquid staking. It's not going to stop. It will it will get more and more and vibrant, more diverse, and more people going to step in. We need to reduce the cost for running a node because there's an operational cost, and we need to onboard normal users being a node runner because you will get on-chain reputation with stakeouts. As I just showed you before, you will see how much has been leaked. You get all this information on-chain. So you don't really have to worry about the this big signage board and flashy thing, but you could also give you to your some sort of um you know business that who are willing to host your node and uh, run a run a staking validation for you. In order to do that, we need to have more capital efficient way of onboarding node, right? For ETH is a large amount of money in the real world for 95% of the world population. And if you want to have more mainstream users using that node and all this kind of, uh, you know, decentralized node running softwares, Ethereum is allow anyone to join as a validator with a computer. So if you should, if you have a computer, you should be able to run a validation for Ethereum. In order to do that, you need to get the capital. So we allow anyone to deposit ETH into a smart contract and give that, you know, we are, we are upping the game from 20. At the moment, it's only up to 28 ETH the public can give to a node runner. With the zero ETH club, it will allow whole amount, whole 32 ETH can be given to a node runner without knowing them. So this will actually get 100% of the validator deposit can come from public without knowing who they are, without you even knowing who the node runners are. But everything is completely taken care of. Now, if you're bringing this kind of a very permissionless, very open, very ad hoc node runner world without having any bond in place, what do you need? You need complete continuous monitoring, right? The stake should not get lost. So you should have an optimal running. And which basically gives by the Ethereum itself, you, you will always know what is a stake balance. You always know if there's a slashing nose. Only thing you got to do is like you have to be proactive and exit. So LST managers can do that. So now LST managers can bring a lot of people from you know unser you know underserved parts of the world, especially from we we need to see a lot of um in an order runners from Africa from geographical decentralization perspective. We need to see a lot of Latam. We need to see a lot of other people who are running in Asia and Africa. At the moment, it's like more centralized, more you know vast, more. I think it's about forty to fifty percent in the U.S. and otherwise in some two or three countries in Europe. We need to see this in thousands or millions of 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 uh, homes, you know, powering this kind of Ethereum decentralized vision. If we want to do that, we can ask them to have some, you know, elect, you know, bear the electricity cost. If you're running one validator, if you're running hundred validators, node running cost is almost similar. It's not going to be you know linearly you know, increasing, but you need state, you need ETH to, to represent as a validator, right? In the node. So you can have this kind of a more decentralized vision, geographical decentralized vision through Zex. So that's the, the overarching goal of Zero ETH Club. Onboarding a lot of node runners 
through a very loosely coupled social mechanism based on on-chain reputation. And I, I want to underline this, on-chain reputation is permissionless. There is no KYC, there is nothing is required, but you can, you know, if some people say that you want to come into LSD and this is gatekeep, this is their arbitrary rules, but you always have an option to go and get it. If you register your BLS key, you need to be, be part of one of the LSD networks so you can join one. But necessarily, you will be get vouched by one of your non-person, right? Hey, I want to run this. I'm a part of a DAO. I'm part of this. I'm part of this. Some, some sort of a social mechanism will vouch you. And then your ECDSA address is, is being added as an inclusion list. Now you can put up BLS keys. That's validators. And then your validators are registered on chain and you know it has an on chain representation and you'll be allowed to receive ETH for that. But this is a very, very highly demanding node running system because you're getting all of the ETH from outside. It has a very less threshold that if you keep going down, if you lose any tiny amount, let's say the threshold will be like LSC says that we only allow you to lose 0.2 ETH. Right. And if you lose point to eat, we're going to eject you. So then you lost the opportunity. The validator will be given to some other performing node operators. It can auto rotate because the way the LST works, it comes back into the LP and the LP can reshuffle to a new node operator in the giant pool. It's an automated conveyor belt. It just work in, 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 in tandem with how these things work. Make sense? You, so you get you'll get a cut of the of the revenue right of the network revenue. Right. Um, now you, now if you're you run asking, it, now you're incentive. asking now you're asking what I what as a node runner I'm going to get it right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so I understand. Okay, if I don't if I don't behave, um, the validator will get ejected and the unstaked ETH will get rotated into a new key. So that that's fair enough. But what if I do run it? You know, if you do run it in um, so. In, in LSD network currently, but again, you can just change this in any way you want to, right? Zek is a modular smart contract, so you can either be part of an LSD network. You could also plug this in in your own stick liquid staking, and you can just have your own rules. How do you want to give the 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 incentive for the node runner, and you want to shift, you know, split it across the depositors, right? It's purely programmable. But currently, we have one template for LSD networks follow, which says that. Node runners and MEV stakers will receive 100% of the MEV earnings, which in the current environment, which is more than the inflation rewards, because inflation rewards goes down as more and more you get staked. So MEV rewards is exclusive for this uh, MEV stakers and node runners, which basically like divided by eight, right? All per validator divided by eight. That's 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 what the 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 MEV will shares. So you get. 20% of, um, you get 20% of the MEV rewards being a ZEC. Uh, no, it's, it's a 10% or it's a, 20%? Yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's, it's 20% of the, um, 20% of what comes of into support. ZEC, but, yeah. but overall on, on network it's, revenue, overall on, on, for that validated temp. Yeah, so it should be yeah. 10% of the overall percentage, 20% of the ZEC pool. So what that means is, you get 10% of the MEV earned, not only from your validator, but from your LST network, because it's it's currently, it's a syndicate model, it's a pooled model. So regardless your validator makes money or someone else validator makes money in your LST network, you get a prorata share. So, you know, it's, a, it's, it's just bringing some more consistency in earning and making sure your operational costs are addressed and you will get some eat immediately liquid in your in your in your wallet, um, you know, to to spend and to keep it going, and now you have more and more validators. You're running, you're taking care of your machines. The better that you're taking care of your machine, your your earning opportunity will increase, and your on chain reputation will go. So more people will try to rehire for other kind of things. It's really really useful. It's really um, expandable in a sense of an on chain reputation as well. Um, does that make sense? Like ten percent. Of the the uh, the total MEV that you're collecting, right? But if you are using the ZEC for any other staking network, you can say that, yeah. Now we have a node runner onboarding mechanism, permissionless and ad hoc. We we still say that ten percent of the whole revenue 
including MEV and earnings, you can do that. No one is going to stop you because you have all the revenues in the smart contracts. So you just say that, boom, uh, put a 10% haircut for uh, the node runners and the rest will be goes to the other uh, token holders that we shoot, ST, ETH, or RE. You can do it. No problem. I mean, it's it's um, it's it's very much doable. So Zero ETH Club is a new set of um, protocol, very modular, very, very useful and highly ambitious. It works in tandem with a CIP protocol, Common Interest Protocol, which is um, a programmable multi-party computation network powered with a DKG, which is a distributed key generation. That means there is a zero knowledge proof always readily available for you whenever you want to decrypt your signing key that has been encrypted on the blockchain. Remember this is on public blockchain Ethereum and you are the one who can only decrypt it. But in Zek, you allow the LST network, the DAO, to decrypt if and if there is something happens to you. So, but it is completely d- driven by smart contracts. So if somebody actually goes and do that, right, everyone can see it, why it happened. So this well, will bring... Re- I, I think some like, I think it might like some context on the balance reporting of the stakehouse. So the stakehouse protocol allows, um, you know, as you alluded to at the start of the course, you know, you don't need any oracles or like a midnight sync or anything. Anyone can balance report any balance, any PLS key. And so that means just syncing the consensus layer. And you can, um, you can, uh, sync the sweeps associated with the validator and, you know, for, uh, reporting and minting inflation rewards. Um, but equally, anybody can report a decrease in balance, a, a non, non-operational inactive validator that's accruing inactivity penalties. So anybody sure. can do that, right? And yeah. smart contracts know about this. And so yeah. at a smart contract level, you can objectively say, this validator is not, not working, right? And needs to rotate. So this is a very good point. So we may take about a couple of minutes of diversion from what you're talking to so just gonna explain this concept. Mm. So the restaking has been like in you know, a widely discussed, right? What what is a restaking? Restaking is you basically allow a consensus layer ETH balance be available for other chains. It could be for execution layer in Ethereum itself, it could be for Cosmos, it could be for rollups. But how can you take the ETH value and represent in tokens or in, in a vault or in an NFT and allow that to be used to secure other kind of networks, right? Or other kind of operations or other kind of financial protocols, right? Anything that you want to have a financial value in E that can be re- represented using the stake balance because Staked ETH is kind of a money sitting in a vault, but there's a problem. The money can go, the balance can go down, balance can go up. But, and also this get wibbly wobbly balance can go down and immediately come back and go down and immediately come back. So there's kind of a random fluctuations there. So you don't know a, if you want to know each and every balance fluctuation, this is an extremely hard problem because you are talking about replicating the entire state of consensus layer. That is not computationally tractable. That's completely, um, you know, overload, overload any kind of mechanism that you want to use it. Where with the balance report that you asked, which brings an elegant solution, checkpoint at state updates, right? So you have this, Induction balance 32, if it goes down, if there is any kind of effective balance, you take the effective balance, so you have a two kind of balance, active balance and effective balance in consensus layer. You take the effective balance, and if it goes down to the, the main threshold, and it, immediately anyone can report and take the share in, consens- in in execution layer. So that they're basically incentivized to get the share that you're talking from the ZEC or, or any, any, any kind of node operator side. Um, so, that because it going down because of the node is go node is not working. That's the primary reason. There's no other reason the balance will go down, either leaking or slashing, right? So that's very objective. So you, you will slash immediately the guy who is represented on the node node running 
or the, the people who provided capital for node runner will be slashed and they will see that immediately and the, the, anyone can do it. So balance reporting is kind of um, um, incentivized crowdsourcing state route update in a checkpointed manner where the checkpointed manner is like just purely based on a conditional checkpoint in a conditional incentive. If it goes down, anyone who have anyone who wants ETH and yield, here you go. Go and take it. It's, this is how arbitrage works. This is how most of the finance open state works, like in AMM works. So it's kind of the same mechanism. It only requires you to do the state update when there is something incentive for you. And when you do that for you, it will all get the, the whole system back in sync balance. But now there's another balance update, which in the earlier, uh, a user used to do that, but now consensus layer will do that for you and execution layer without paying any gas costs called sweep. So there is like an, a, a cyclical um, balance update from consensus layer to, to execution layer, which will push any amount of ETH that you earn be in a, about 32 ETH will come back to execution layer. So again, now, what do you have? 32 E, as I said, it can go down and can come back up, but you can go up and it can come down, right? So that's another phenomenon, right? Anything above 32 E can come back to 32 when the sweep is happening. So that is also getting updated with the validator. So you have the BLS key, you have this kind of a conditional state update getting reflected on a stakehouse protocol and that further get updated with the LST network. So the stakehouse yeah. protocol literally providing a full atomic inventory for anything that you want to reuse from stake the balance from a consensus layer. Make sense? These sweeps are protected, right? Yeah. That's why we call them protected stakers. Once the once ETH is paid to the protocol, they cannot be slashed by the consensus layer. Once it's in the execution layer, it cannot be touched by the by the, by the consensus layer. Two different chain. Sorry, two different um, state storage. So two different chain in, in, in a sense mm -hmm. that as a blockchain state, consensus layer is having its own state, execution layer its own state. Execution layer depend uh, with the consensus layer state to append the blocks, right? So, but it's totally different to environment. So consensus layer cannot touch anything sitting on execution layer. Similarly, execution layer cannot touch anything sitting on the consensus layer. And that's the biggest problem that we said. Deposit token currently doesn't have an atom in an atom city with the, the consensus layer state deposit. You really need to keep the state in sync from time to time. If, if I'm participating in LSD running a node and, and the revenue, so I, I can do the restaking as well, right? I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so th there, are, there are many other ways, right? You can, you can, sorry, can you repeat that question once again? So, oh, I can I, like, uh, so if, if I'm, I'm running the node, I, I'm, I'm a Zek node operator. So, uh, running the node, I enjoy the, the, the revenue from, from the network, the Ethereum network, but I can enjoy revenue from other networks as well, right? Restaking. Yeah, yeah that's what I said, the restaking. You can actually use this. You don't really have to worry about the DEs or anything like that. What you do is like you stake your ETH, you register with the stakehouse and you have a, a position called NOT, which basically, you know, linking with execution layer. Now you have a, a state update tokenized stake position for each validator. Now you can call that smart contract and you restake that to any other network. You can always know how much ETH is there in that validator. If you want to slash it, you, you, you want to slash that money, which is receiving from a um, sweep amount, you can take it. You don't really have to have any kind of Oracle. The withdrawal is also completely automated by Stakeout. So whenever that money comes back, you can do this additional liabilities that you may have occurred in restaked positions for other middlewares, other networks can also be reconciled. Make sense? Like you may have accrued liability from doing other things, but whenever that comes, it can go back to 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 the the you know the people who she should you owe off the debt because you may receive some yield from the middlewares for running that service, right? Giving that cap. So reusability of the capital is literally endless. You can just rehypothecate like in you know, a three or four times, but the accounting mechanism is full end to end. 
it doesn't miss a shot. It's fully smart contracts, fully atomic. You can restake your validated position. You can restake your protected position. You can restake your MEV position. You can restake your portfolio. You can do anything. For example, as he said, let me give you another spin to this restaking. You want to provide this protected risk-free rate from ETH to another network. Let's go. Give me one another network, different chain. Gnosis? Gnosis, yeah. What's up? Yeah. Yeah. So you could basically say that all I've we have n number of validators registered here and restake with stakeouts. Now the protected deposits will just basically go exclusively to Gnosis, right? And Gnosis is very, you know, it's it's kind of another chain, but it's the same beacon chain. They have a beacon chain, etc. But what they have now curated validator position. Similarly, if you want to do the rollups, the, the recent rollup is much more easy to think because their security is anchored with the, the, the Ethereum, which is also easy to do. But the, 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 the reason I said Gnosis is because it's Gnosis is a different chain altogether. So you can, you can get all the protected ETH, simply think it like you're plumbing a pipe, uh, you know, some, uh, a fire hose to, to Ethereum trustlessly to receive ETH and inflation rewards on Gnosis automatically. And then if you, you can just reuse it, that faucet to allow the deposit, come here and deposit, and then all the protected ETH will go there. And then whenever the withdrawal comes, it will also get, get back ETH because ETH is here, right? So you can do that. Restaking is not only for in a running a, for a network, you could actually use the liquidity. You could use the restaked ETH liquidity for other chains to operate and enjoy that liquidity have a native yield. And it, it is redeemable one is to one for E that is guaranteed by consensus leg, guaranteed by Ethereum execution layer. So you don't really have to worry about any intermediary. So the a peg that, or something like that, right? You right. can just because you right. can just burn your token. It's like wrapped ETH, right? You don't have a peg for wrapped ETH, right? Exactly. So with the Zec, think about you know, Gnosis chain has the same software, right? You can have a DAP node running Gnosis and Ethereum, a node runner, and he he enjoy he can just, you know, register here and then he will also become a, a, a conduit for getting more liquidity to Gnosis because it's the same node software, right? You don't really have to worry about anything, but you get this kind of a more um, a composable, decentralized node runners who can uh, run for you, who can run for your sister networks, who can run for your rollups, and they can also do some sort of sequencers. So you, you use a restake for uh, if you, if some point that we get decentralized de um, sequencer network for the rollups, you know, you want to get some slashing, that's also possible. But essentially, the capital here is reusable programmatically. It's fully verified contracts and it's been in operation for more than a year, you can build anything you want. There is one LST networks. Now we have a ZEC that is a combination of um, pooled ETH for node runners to run machines for Ethereum without having an upfront capital. Simple as that. Without having any ETH capital, you can start running node and enjoy having as many validators that you want from anywhere 24 seven, um, just using smart contracts. And they, you can, uh, yeah, I guess we all can talk about the, um, if I'm not mistaken, you can put, anyone can inject the keys that they, that they choose, right? Because ultimately they can be rotated. So you don't have to have like predefined keys or pre-generated keys or, you know, n none of that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's ad hoc, um, permissionless. Yeah, right. Manuel, do you want to take it away? Yeah. Sure. Um, I will start with sharing my screen. So I hope you can see this. Yeah. So, okay, good. So this is what the sect looks like. I, and I'll tell you how. So basically, uh, 
to start with, we have the network DAO and then the sub DAO, which is basically the ZEC committee member. So whenever a ZEC committee members uh, include all the LSD DAOs, so whoever wants to be a part of ZEC, they need to come to the network DAO, which is basically the block sub DAO. They whitelist these mm -hmm. LSDs to be a part of SEC. And once they are a part of SEC, they can go ahead and whitelist node operators from their LSDs so that these whitelisted node operators can run this uh, validator. So this, this is called a permission pool because obviously you have to go through uh, multiple layers of permissions. Basically, first is the network DAO, then the SEC committee members and all. So it's a little restricted because we just cannot give away 32 each to some, some arbitrary address. And that will be, I mean, it will be a shame if we lose to, or those many ETH of the users. So it has to be the, this permission. So now that the SEC committee members uh, consist of the LSD DAOs, they can go ahead and whitelist the node operators. So in this SEC pool, each of these LSDs uh, will be uh, represented as the smart wallet. So when a node operator comes in and they'll be sitting uh, until each comes in. So these depositors here, uh, they will deposit each uh, minimum of 0 0.001 and maximum as much as they want. But for a single PLS public key, the max that they can contribute is for each. So when the depositors deposit each, a batch is allocated and each batch comprise of four each. So as soon as four each is at least four each is available, any of the whitelisted node operators can come in and they can propose a PLS public key so proposing a BLS public key means that this BLS public key will be associated with that batch and will be ready to ship to the liquid staking manager, which will take on the next step of uh, staking it to the deposit contracts. So that's how it works. Um, right, since the node operator does not need to provide any each contribution in, in this 32 each, uh, we still need to be careful that they do not turn out to be malicious and all. So for this, we have a CIP bond amount, basically a very small amount that the node operators need to deposit for a PBLS public key. And this will be used for further key recovery process in case they turn out to be malicious. So we'll talk, talk about it when we'll be discussing it in the contracts. So. As of now, you can see four ETH comes in and the depositors get back four SEC LP tokens. Similarly, the node operator who proposes the PLS public key will get one SEC LP token, meaning that uh, out of all the rewards that pour into the SEC pool, uh, there's a four is to one ratio here, meaning that 20% of the SEC pool rewards goes to the node operators and the 80% goes to the depositors. Uh, right, and all these rewards comes in via the syndicate, which is the uh, which basically distributes all the MEV rewards here. So, as we've discussed majorly about the LSTs, uh, we can take a deeper drive and uh, dive via the contracts. So, let's have a look here. We have the SEC representative, basically. Uh, this SEC committee comprises of so many LSD DAO addresses, right? But they together can form an uh, association and propose a single SEC address, which can be later uh, used for various purposes. Similarly, we have the BlockSwap DAO defined, which is the network DAO, as we saw in the flow diagram. Then we have the EOA representative. The EOA representative is the uh, is appointed by again the BlockSub DAO or the SEC committee, and this representative works on behalf of the node runner in case uh, needed. And we'll be able to do various uh, activities which the Stakehouse protocol allows us to. So, 
okay zpl is public key limit so whenever the i mean the z pool itself uh, has a upper limit on how many pls public keys it can propose so uh, this max limit is the z uh, pls public key limit and it can be updated by only the block sub dao or the network dao similarly we have the cip bond amount which is uh, i mean initially it will be set to around 100 dollars which will be 0.001 eth so very less amount and then we have the pls public key proposal limit which is the total number of pls public keys that a node operator can uh, take via the sec so there will be a limit uh, there will be a global limit on the sec pool as well as there will be a local limit on the node operator on how many pls public keys they can register and we can see something like claim delay so this will be discussed further but uh, in short claim delay is a waiting time that the node operator faces when he uh, when he claims his rewards so let's go further and see here uh, we have initially we have the modifiers so all the modifiers are for the sec committee and then the we have one for whitelisted node operators one for sec representative committee and block sub dog so various functionalities provided by the sec uh, depend on the uh, roles that can be called by so some can only be called by the block sub dog some can be called by the committee and the dog and some can only be called by the uh, node operators so that's about it and Right. Um, yeah. So here we can see we have this function add DAO to Z committee, and it can only be called by the block sub DAO, that is the network DAO. So first step, as we saw earlier, uh, was introducing the LST DAOs to the Z committee. So the block sub DAO uh, picks up the DAO address and the liquid staking. Uh, LSD that they are running, so the liquid staking manager address. And once they are whitelisted, they are made a part of the ZEC committee. And similarly, the block sub DAO can also uh, remove them from the ZEC committee if uh, needed. Then once the LSDs are, are the part of uh, ZEC committee, they can go ahead and whitelist the node operators. So the node operator that they white whitelist can only be a part of their liquid staking manager. So it cannot be that if I propose a node operator, he will run a node for some other LSD. That's not possible here because I have whitelisted a node operator uh, and I sort of share a credibility there. So if anything goes wrong, then I will have to answer it to the depositors that why did it go wrong or why did I choose that node operator for this? So similarly, we have a batch uh, functionality for this. Basically, I can whitelist all multiple node operators in a single transaction and I can even ban node operators. So this can be called by the SEC committee members or the block sub DAO if they find that a node operator is malicious or it's not performing its duty, then they can be banned from the SEC pool altogether so now that we have whitelisted the lsts and then whitelisted the node operators next uh, step comes in uh, the batch deposit eat so this function uh, can only be called by the node operators because here we are trying to say that whatever eth has uh, been collected by the sec pool it is ready to be staked so the node operator will uh, introduce the PLS public keys, the PLS uh, signatures rel related to those keys, and then uh, ask the ZEC pool to uh, send those funds to the liquid staking manager. So we can see here uh, stake giant pool funds. This is a Boolean parameter, which basically is up to the node operator. So if the ZEC node operator sees that there is not enough ETH present in the giant MEF pool or the giant protected staking pool, 
but there is uh, at least four ETH present in the Zec pool, then that means the batch, the Zec batch is ready to be registered by the liquid staking manager. So what you can do is uh, set this to false and come back later when he sees that the other giant pools have funds ready to be staked. So in a separate transaction, the node operator can come and deposit those ETH, send those ETH from the giant pools to the liquid staking manager. So here, the as discussed, the first step is basically idle ETH is decreased by 4 ETH, meaning that 4 ETH is being sent from the sec pool to the liquid staking manager and then send ETH from giant pool. This function here sends so if it was set to true, that means there was enough funds uh, in the giant pool, then those funds will be sent along with this four ETH of patch uh, proposed by the set pool. And if it, if so it this was, is the part, this, this, is, this is the part that Matt was talking about. This is basically like your, um, you know, a validator, the, the, the fund for the validator is broken up into these three buckets, right? So you have, yeah. In that case, uh, one bucket funding the node operators for ETH, uh, the giant uh, um, protected staking pool is doing the 24 ETH, and then finally the 4 ETH is the MEV stakers, right? And you can, in one transaction as the second node operator, all you do is you can't access the funds, right? But you're just paying the gas to send to, 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 to collect all the funds to get it together to uh, send it to the Ethereum deposit contract, right? So your operational cost is the, the cost of potentially. Um, Recovering, uh, uh, sorry, ret ejecting the node if, if you're malicious, and your cost is gas, right? That's it. But you, you, you're not putting up, you know, uh, you're not putting up uh, like uh, what is it, like seven thousand dollars at today's money. You're not, you know, you're not doing that to, to run a node, right? Or the other thirty-three. So you are just um, pledging a, a, a machine, right, and paying the gas bill. If I understand that, right? Correct. Yeah. So yeah, as you pointed out. This year, liquid staking managers register BLS publicly. Here, we are sending the uh, the seg bucket, the node operator bucket of four ETH, and then in the in this send ETH from giant pool, we are sending the rest of the twenty four plus four ETH from the giant pools. So in in all together, we are saying that the thirty two ETH is available to be staked. So all of this happens in a single transaction, and as a separate step, the node operator can go ahead and deposit these ready 32 each ready to stake and then that's it uh, that's done basically but yeah uh, continuing on this uh, let's say if the fund wasn't available in the giant pools so what happens here is the node operator is given uh, one hour of time basically uh, they'll have one hour uh, to collect funds from the giant pool and send it uh, to the deposit contract. If not, then the four ETH which was sent previously to the liquid staking manager will be called back to this uh, to the Zec pool, so that someone else who, let's say, there's another Zec node operator who sees that I have enough funds ready to stake, so he can call back this ETH back to the uh, Zec pool and then register it with his own BLS public key. Wait, 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 wait. So this, this is a, it's a good point. Um, let me let me get my head around this. So you're saying that there are three pools, a mini hmm. pool, uh, protected staking pool, and now we have a ZEC pool, right? Correct. Which is node runner's pool. And now you have node runner who registered the BLS key and who's waiting for money. Now, what you're saying is like ZEC has four ETH, right? Um, yeah. And this node runner automatic, you know, took that for ETH, or is it already assigned to to the node runner? No, he took that for ETH. Yeah, so he he consumed the four ETH from the pool, and Correct. the pool is demanding. He can only consume. Um, the pool is demanding he should utilize that for ETH to stake a validator within an hour. Correct. Right. If if it's not, if the node runner hasn't registered a validator in an hour, hasn't staked, then that 4E that is given to the node runner will be pulled back to the pool itself. 
Yeah, not automatically, but another node operator can see that uh, there's each uh, sitting idly in the LSM, which I can use, so he can call back each. To yeah, yeah, side. sure. So, yeah. so uh, let me let me put this way. Um, I'm a node runner, and you're a node runner. Mm -hmm. You took the four ETH from Zek, okay? Yeah. I'm a node runner. I receive 28 ETH through fund delegation in LST. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in LST, you can either give through the giant pool or you can give directly to um, a, a validator, right? Where I receive yeah. 28 ETH. But now... I, I don't have four ETH because, you know, 28 ETH has been received. I still need to have four more ETH, right? So mm -hmm. I can simply see that, uh, you know, I can simply trigger my staking and it will pull the four ETH that has not been used and is sitting idle for more than an hour from any of the registered ZEC validator who consumed. It will come to my validator and I will just go ahead and stake it. Correct. Okay, Those, okay. yeah. So it's a it's a it's a it's a batch management mechanism related to the Z pool. Not not relate not it works in tandem with any other pool that is supplying ETH for the validator and who is seeking for ETH from the Z pool. It mm -hmm. has no dependency with oh the giant pool has twenty four ETH. So I can pull back. There is no, there is no rule like that. It only yeah. limited to the the global rule is just to the Zek pool. You may receive ETH from a giant pool. You may receive directly from front delegation. You may, you may just receive from yourself. I don't know, but it just only deals with the Zek, right? So correct. Okay, cool. Thank you. The batch, the batch management is quite interesting. It's like um, so. Uh, the, the, the ETH is sliced up uh, into uh, multiples of uh, four ETH, right, Manil? Um, yeah. And so users, that's what uh, Matt was showing on the monitoring. Users are able to see exactly when you deposit ETH, um, it's through the batch tracking method that uh, we can say, okay, well, you put four ETH, you're part of batch number five. That means your ETH was staked with BLS key OX123, blah, blah, blah. And you can see the performance of it, and you can, you can see IP the validator. You can, you know, raise raise a thing with uh, the LSD network. You can say, hey, have you guys? You, you see this? It's called um, on Twitter. What is it called? Ether pools or something like that. I can't remember what it's called on 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 Twitter or X or whatever it's called. Um, uh, you know, they are like, hey, um, Coinbase, have you noticed? I don't know if it was Coinbase or or if it's like uh, they, they just look at the big staking entities. So they'll, they'll, they'll flag just as an example. Hey, so-and-so, have you spotted your validators are offline, right? And you can do the same with, you say as the monitoring, but it's more granular. And you can say, well, there's this node operator not running. They need to, somebody needs to like uh, have a look at the machine or it needs to be rotated if it's, you know, sustained. Yeah, so that, that's, that's, that's really true. Yeah. The way that I see the batch management at a larger picture is like you have a pool mechanism with an adaptive queue management, right? Um, it not only it 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 allows you to give a chunks as a batch to to deposit, but it also allows you to replenish those um, batches. If someone actually pulled the money, so if you have a batch for ETH, you may have like 400 LPs in that for ETH. Some of them withdraw the money, so anyone who wanna wanna put the money into a pool, they can withdraw, right? That's the quote unquote the basic nature of any kind of pool deposit pool in DeFi. So anyone can withdraw 24/7. So if they withdraw, how do you get the next available deposit to move to that batch because you already sliced? the entire deposit into different, different chunks. Now you have a small amount that need to be refilled. This adaptive queue management with replenishing mechanism, the batch that you're talking, correct? Yeah. Right. Um, so since we're on the topic of batch management, uh, I as well uh, can discuss callback it. So this is the function which calls back eat from the LSM back to the Zek pool in case the one hour, uh, the user has gone 
way beyond one hour and and yeah so we initially stored the timestamp when the bls public key was uh, registered by the lsm and the for each was sent via the zec pool but now since one hour one hour has passed then i can go ahead and say that a certain bls public key which was uh, which used those for each is no longer using it because it it is past the deadline of one hour so what we can do here is uh, we can ask the lsm to withdraw that withdraw it for not so basically saying that uh, i want back the for each and what the lsm will do it here is it will ban that bls public key so no one in the whole lst can use that bls public key again for running a node they if they want to they'll have to generate a new bls public key but they cannot continue with that one. so basically saying that reject that bls public key give me back my for each since uh, so for each comes back to this contract and then what also happens is all the users that uh, that were associated with that batch will be appointed to a new batch which has no bls public key meaning that it is again ready to stake for another node operator so this is how the callback works and once the eth is ready to stake from the zec pool um, we can also see that let's say the eth is also ready to stake from the giant pool so with this send eth from giant pools function it will check that the giant save it giant protected staking pool has at least 24 eth and then the giant mev pool has at least 4 eth meaning that this adds to 28 and the other four are already in the zec pool so we will simply send those uh, to the lsm uh, here so we ask the giant save it pool to deposit those eth to the lsm and similarly we ask the giant mev pool to deposit those eth so now that the lsm has uh, 32 eth the next step is the node operator goes to that uh, particular lsm and then uh, triggers a stake stake is basically Wait, the last uh, step sorry did you lsm did you uh, liquid give staking it... manager yeah and uh, do you have like a wizard how does that work right so we have uh, basically uh, an Did sdk which the user can which anyone can use uh, to do so uh, simply go if, on... if you can show the diagram the original lsd diagram that would help the not this one the um, so this is for zack but mm. uh, the the one i mean is um, yeah just just to give context of like what is the beating heart of lsd here right um mm. maybe we can change to lsd at the top oh sorry it is this yeah 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 so how does this flow to the ethereum deposit contract mm. right so we currently discussed how the for it from the zec pool was sent to the lsm lsm is the liquid staking manager which is uh, as vincent mentioned the heart of the liquid staking derivatives so every lsd network has a unique liquid staking manager which basically manages all the eth that flows through the lsd to the uh, to the deposit contract so what happens here is the giant staking funds vault had collected 4 eth for a bls public key the giant protected staking pool had collected 24 eth and then the node runner in this case the zec pool connect, collected the rest of the 4 eth so now that all the 32 eth are available the node operator comes to this liquid staking manager and says that for my bls public key i have enough eth which i can send go ahead and send it to the deposit contract so the liquid staking manager here then uh, collects this eth from all the three places and sends it to the ethereum deposit contract and that's it uh, 
it is state. That was a final step here, basically. So for anyone to use this, they can use the wizard SDK here. And it has all these con all the contracts that are a part of LSD are uh, uh, I mean, they can be found here in the contracts class, the LSM basically. Then we also have the Savy Thwart, Fees and Map, the Giant Pools. All these contracts can be found in the SDK, and the functions can be used to go ahead and then stake the ETH. So let's say, uh, I mean, now that the 32 ETH has been staked, there is a uh, uh, waiting period where the Ethereum deposit contract uh, checks for this PLS public key, finalize everything, and then it gives it a go, after which the validator is set to active, and it can start uh, earning rewards. So let's say after a certain period of time, the PLS public key has been running, the validator has been running, and it has been collecting rewards. So now, uh, initially, there was only a single node operator in case of LSD, which was directly getting its rewards from the liquid staking manager. Uh, but now we have a whole sec pool which has taken over this single node uh, node runner entity. So what it will do here, uh, the sec pool will now have to get its rewards from the liquid staking manager because the rewards that were the fees and map rewards that were flowing in uh, half of it went to the giant map pool and the other half uh, comes into the liquid staking manager so here uh, let's have a look at uh, claim rewards so the any of the uh, users can call this uh, claim rewards function Sorry, uh, any of the users can call this a claim rewards function here, which will uh, mean that they will uh, be able to claim the rewards that that was flowing in via the LSM. So we have this uh, claim existing rewards, and it has transfer key. Right, so fetch sec rewards here is the first step, and that basically a, gets all the rewards for all the BLS public keys for this node operator. So what it will do, it will see, it will collect all the BLS public keys, and for them uh, get all the ETH and rewards. So here we say we first check that the liquid staking manager is uh, known to the network. And if it is known, then claim rewards as no runner. Since the Zec pool itself, whenever a Zec pool uh, is introduced to a certain LSD, the Zec pool itself becomes a node operator. Uh, so it's a contract which is running as a node operator. In, and then here it can claim the rewards. So all the node operator rewards flow into the Zec pool, and then it can be distributed both to the individual node runner and then the depositors who put in their ETH uh, to run this node. So that's how the claim rewards work here. Um, I mean, it's a lot more detailed, but this was an overview. We also have other functionalities such as recovering, signing key, while sec, I mean, the this basically is the CIP procedure that we previously discussed. So if a node operator goes rogue or malicious, then the, the network DAO or the sub DAO, which is basically the SEC committee members, they can take over a particular BLS public key. And uh, once they get the BLS private key, they can go ahead and then uh, just distribute those get the ETH here uh, in the SEC pool and then 
uh, all the depositors will get back their ETH. And similarly, we have trade squid in case uh, in case they want to exit. So after the CIP was done, they'll have to call rage squid, which will do the rest of the process. Here. So that's from the contract perspective. Let me know when if I miss something or if we can go through something else. So um, yeah, I think it's just worth uh, the mentioning that. Um, we want to sort of encourage like a discussion around this um, and uh, get feedback. Uh, so, um, you know, it is, uh, it's something that is available on um, uh, an early alpha version, you know, uh, alpha meaning obviously that it can, you know, it's not bug free and it's um, um, under heavy testing. Um, but also that there might be some tweaks. I mean, if anything, it's only going to get simpler. So if you want to get uh, a, a handle on, on, on Zero ETH Club yourself, uh, this walkthrough alongside uh, this README. So we've put a README together, um, high level overview, what's sec, um, you know, frequently, potentially frequently asked questions, the diagram that you've already seen, um, source code for, for Zek, um, and, um, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, I think it's just like there for an open discussion, right? So. Can I can I ask a question here? Mm, mm. So if anyone want to use a Zek code base, just feel free to use it as in a sandbox. And if you're doing any kind of issues, you can raise a PR, right? It's in Stakeout Dev. Come and raise a PR. Or you may, if you want to ask any questions, you can come to the Discord and happy to assist there. One thing to understand is that that the the Zek. If you want, also want to try how the ejection works, then we can give a um, a designated, you know, uh, MPC solver for you know decryption. So you can you can you can test in completion uh, in a complete mode. Um, you know, feel free to to raise any PR. Feel free to 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 come and talk to us in this code. Um, we can help, but just just but be there's aware. a default committee, right? But but people yeah. can spin up their own committees. If, yeah, 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 yeah. Because Zek, anyone, anyone can use this this contract to enable um, capital free node running, right? So currently, the node running works in two different ways. Lido and other other guys who have a gatekeeping mechanism, right? Where you go as a node runner and then you get listed, then you will get ETH, and then they will give you thirty two ETH per node runner. Some sort of a social mechanism behind the scene. It's very cumbersome. It's very operational inefficient. It's it's super heavy, you know, um, operational cost, like things like that. Think it like all of that is available for anyone without having almost net zero operational cost, right? Because it it, it, it it works in uh, uh, completely in, in automation. So you can onboard um, node runners, and this will take care of it entirely. And if you if you think that node runner is not running correct. Just eject it and rotate the capital. So it, you don't really have to worry about what the people who put the money. Uh, it will have a continuous staking mechanism. Like it will go back to the pool and then it will it will come back and uh, staked and the, they will see it going on. So if you are an existing LSC network, even if you're an LSD network in the LSD platform on Stakeouts, Blockstep LSD networks, or if you are having any LST tokens who actually want to have like you know backend mechanism to be more smart contract driven. You want to remove the Oracle, you want to remove the intermediaries, try to use this. Um, you know, um, you don't really have to know your node runner. Um, you don't you don't really have to understand what they're doing, where they're coming from, everything is on chain. Try to run this in a sandbox, not in a production environment. We again like this is alpha version, but try to run it in Gorilla Holski. Gorilla is going to be sunset Holski. Um, and come talk to us, and we can actually give the 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 uh, any help. We can give you this kind of a designated uh, MPC solver as well. So you don't really have to worry about that. One. Make sense? Just want to make sure. Any way that you want, we want to increase a geographical node running decentralization for Ethereum. We are here to help. There is no cost attached to it. It's just simply smart contracts. Yeah. 
Anything to add? It makes sense to me from my side. Any question, guys? Anyone has anything? All right. I think we can wrap. All right. Towards the sec. Zero ETH world and zero scam world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Thank you.